So here's the thing. I think Britain, modern Britain, the country that we live in, was born with a birth defect. And you know, when I think about it, we're a nation that really came from a history of empire. If it wasn't for the empire, we wouldn't be the country we are. We wouldn't have had our place on the world stage. We wouldn't have been able to win two world wars. We wouldn't have the multicultural population that gives us the cutting edge in international competitiveness and in the cultural tourism that we attract from all over the world. We just wouldn't be the country that we know today. But that birth through the British Empire is a story of hundreds of years of oppression based on a very, very simple idea. And that idea is that there is something inherently superior about white British people as a race, a race that represents civilization, a race that represents literature, modernity, invention, science, a race that is so much better than others around the world, that it had a divine right, an entitlement to conquer, subordinate, and rule over those people. Now, I think most British people would say they don't believe that anymore. You know, that those are ideas that were a product of their time, that it doesn't apply to modern Britain. There are very few people who would go around now saying that it's the role of white British people to subjugate lesser races and rule over them, to civilize and Christianize them and take away their savage past. But the thing is, there wasn't a moment where that idea changed. I mean, who can tell me a time in the 20th century where overnight those ideas disappeared? Instead, what happened was that the empire began to melt away after the Second World War. Countries that used to be part of what fed Britain, the machinery that allowed Britain to be great, they began to declare their own independence. And then their people started to come to this country. And then Britain, having won the Second World War, wanted to be on the right side of history and reinvented itself as a nation that's always on the right side. British people began to talk about the terrible racism that exists in America and congratulate themselves on the fact that we don't have anything like that here. We never had plantations in Britain and slaves in Britain. We never had Jim Crow segregation in Britain. We wouldn't do anything like that. We're Britain. We're a good nation, a nation built on values of fairness and justice and equality. The thing is, that's a lie. Britain had a deep south where there was plantation slavery, where black people were deprived of their lives, their liberty, and where the products of their labor was used to build our economy. It's just that our deep south was a little bit further away. It was in the Caribbean, British territories, plantations owned and ruled over by British people, but it was out of sight, out of mind. How many British people today even really understand what happened in the Caribbean? They go to Jamaica on holiday for weddings and honeymoons. If they visit the plantation great houses that still stand, they usually do so to take pictures of the lawn or the steps or to have a spooky evening with a ghost story. I've been to these places, I've seen them. And I sometimes think, imagine going to Auschwitz and having your wedding pictures taken on the steps because that's the scale of suffering and oppression and murder that took place in the British Empire. But we don't talk about it. And why am I talking about it today? All of those years of silence have obscured a pain and a suffering and a trauma that people descended from that history feel. They feel it in their bones. They've inherited it from their ancestors. Do you know how many people there are in Britain, black British people, whose surname is the name of the plantation owner, the slave master, that took away their family's culture, freedom, agency, story, even their name? We bear those scars in every part of our inheritance. Do you know how many Africans in this country left the place of their ancestors because of the changes that were brought in by empire, the land that was taken away, the roles that were changed, the economy that was restructured in the interests of economies like Britain, so that all of their ingenuity was reduced to a crop that could be exported, or gold, or minerals, or diamonds that could be used to make British companies, British families rich. That silence has allowed British people to feed themselves a lie it's made us a fragile country, a country that believes in easy populist solutions to very deep problems. 
the idea that if we just get rid of, of the foreigners in our country, if we get rid of immigrants, if we make sure there aren't too many Muslims or that there aren't too many people who speak a different language, then we'll somehow magically be great again. But what's happening right now is that people are tired of being silent and pretending that everything is okay. And I think there are a few reasons for this moment, this moment that feels like the weight of this history has come back with a vengeance and begun to shape our present in a new way. And one reason is COVID. We've been at home, we've been under lockdown, and the government told us we were all in this together. You know, it was everybody leveled by this crisis and we're all suffering through it in the same way and it affects us all equally. That's what we were told until we started to notice something that was really hard to make sense of. When the faces started appearing of the people who were dying of COVID, the bus drivers, the supermarket workers, the nurses, the doctors who died treating others, serving others, keeping things moving so that we could stay alive, we started to see a picture. They were black, they were brown, they were Muslim. They were, in some cases, without exception, groups of people who were not white, who came from these stories of empire that we don't talk about. These were the people paying a wildly disproportionate price for this pandemic. We weren't in it together. They were suffering more. They were dying more. And then we looked to our leaders and said, something's happening here. People from ethnic minority backgrounds are getting sick and dying in numbers that seem completely out of step with the bigger picture. And we had to fight before they began to investigate that. We had to write, we had to talk, we had to shout, we had to petition. And finally, we got an inquiry into why so many people from ethnic minority backgrounds are dying from COVID and it told us nothing. It told us what we already knew. And as I speak now, those people more likely to die from COVID are still being sent to work without any extra protection. There's no guidance as to how to protect people who are so much more vulnerable. Their lives are still being seen as expendable. Why? That's the question that has been on so many of our minds. So that when we watched a video from America of a black man being knelt on by a police officer as the life literally drained from his body, and then we saw his little daughter playing with her mother's hair as the family spoke on TV about how they felt the grief of his loss. And then we remembered the names of all the other African Americans who we've seen killed at the hands of the police. And then we began to remember our own names in Britain, Mzee Mohammed, Sean Rigg, Sheku Bayo, so many people over the years who have died here too from the same brutality, the same violence at the hands of the state. We didn't have any distractions to keep us quiet this time. We're still under lockdown. There are no sports matches. There's no going drinking to the pub. There's no going to the office and gossiping with your colleagues. We've been under lockdown with the same pain we've always had and the same silence we've always had to tolerate, and the same lies we've always had to listen to, only this time, we mobilized. We channeled that anger and we marched. As I'm speaking now, people are on the streets marching in this country, in the US, across Europe, Australia, so much of the world, people have said they have had enough of a system that treats black lives as expendable and then tries to demonize us when we protest. This is a moment that feels different. It feels different because we're starting to learn a language of how to actually articulate what's going on right now. We were told we shouldn't protest, we shouldn't march. We were told that they're riots and they're violent. But we know what violence is. Violence is taking black British people who came during the Windrush generation, who've been here all their lives, and deporting them to countries they don't know. Violence is sending mothers to food banks to feed their children because we were told that the state can't afford to give them the money they need to live on, even when they have jobs, even when they work. 
knowing that the conditions are so exploitative that they can't afford to feed their families. That's violence. Violence is a criminal justice system that actually imprisons black people in Britain at more disproportionate rates than the American prison system incarcerates African Americans. And violence is the silence that we hear in the mainstream, the deafening silence, as all of this has continued for decade after decade and generation after generation, when it's been people who feel that pain, people who come from those families, who come from those communities, people who, when there's a story about racism, the press calls to come and sit on a debate where we're expected to persuade the audience that racism exists. That's violence. We know what violence looks like. So when the government tells us that we should just be quiet and behave ourselves, we've had enough. That's why when we protest, we've been saying enough is enough. That's why we've been saying white silence is violence. That's why we've been saying black lives matter. And you know, I think we're at a moment where enough people have strategically learnt that language to try and co-opt it. I heard the Conservative Health Secretary stand up in the House of Commons and say Black Lives Matter. And in the same speech, he undermined the work that needs to happen to find out why so many black people are dying from COVID. So we have to step up now. It's not just about saying that you care or saying that you want change. We know what that looks like. We've been hearing that, in my case, all my life. This is where we start to really understand how this system is not something that is broken. This is a system that was built. It was built this way, to preserve these structures of power, to keep privilege flowing to those who benefit from it. And the cost of that, as we know, is to value some lives less and to rely on the fact that those devalued human beings won't be able to challenge the system because they don't have the means and they're not organized and they're not articulate and they can't navigate the channels of power to even express their reality. That's what's changing. We know how to articulate what we see and we know the truth and we know how to express it. And now we're united with other people all over the planet who are witnessing and living through the same things. So this is a moment to learn, to learn how we got here, to learn how this system was built, to learn who benefits, to learn the history that brought us here. And it's not a time to reinvent the wheel. There are so many people who have been fighting this before anyone knew the name George Floyd. They have been doing this work. They've been channeling that rage at this violence. They've been showing us how we can move forward. We have to learn from people who went before. We have to take this on. We have to be smart. So feel the anger at what's happening now. Ask yourself how you can be useful. But let's not react. Let's strategize. That doesn't mean stay at home. That doesn't mean be quiet. That doesn't mean do what you're told. Go out, protest, make your voice heard. We don't want to de-escalate this situation. We want to dismantle this entire system. That's why I speak. Because if there's any small way in which I can be part of that, if I can help, then I'm here. <laughs>